Hello and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews, we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime, and I'm very excited to start another individual study with you today about Jackie Cirone of the Chicago Outfit. A man devoted to both his work and his family, Jackie Cirone has been the most requested of all of the men that I've done so far, and so today we're going to talk about his life. I have plenty to discuss with you, so let's get right to it. John Philip Cirone was born in Chicago, Illinois on July 7, 1914 to an immigrant couple from Muro Lugano, Italy, Giuseppe and Rosamaria Cirone. Giuseppe and Rosamaria Cirone came to the United States in 1890. The couple met in Italy, married in Chicago, and were extremely devoted to one another. This type of devotion and fidelity would be passed on to their son Jackie Cirone, making him a rare breed among Cosa Nostra men when he married Clara Russo. Cirone's father worked for the city of Chicago, and in the 1930s, Cirone was working as a dealer at the Rock Garden Gambling Parlor on Cermak and Cicero Avenue. It was here that Cirone would first meet Clara Russo, daughter of Frank Russo, a naturalized citizen from Sicily who knew Al Capone and his men. He had secured a job for his daughter at the gambling parlor, Everyone knew that the beautiful redhead with the big personality was off limits. Her safety had been guaranteed by the city's biggest names in the outfit. That did not stop the young Jack Gironi from taking his shot. Gironi was smitten immediately upon seeing Clara Russo. One night while Russo was waiting for a ride, Gironi offered to drive her home and the rest was history. They would be married and have two children, Jack and Jill. From all accounts, Gironi seemed to be a reliable, faithful husband who was happily married to the woman who has been described as the Princess Diana of the Chicago outfit. He loved her big personality, her excellent cooking, perfect grammar. In English and Yiddish, she grew up in a Jewish neighborhood. And of course, her beauty. For her, he was a handsome, funny, reliable provider, a dutiful husband and father. In fact, she only had two complaints about Jackie, his lack of hair and his inability to cook. According to the 1940 census, the two lived on Huron Street with their son Jack. During this time, Cirone was also growing into his role in the Chicago outfit. It is in his work that we see the brutality and dangerousness that is often associated with Cirone. During the 1950s, he became the chauffeur for the boss himself, Tony Accardo. He quickly gained Accardo's favor. Cirone is described by those who knew him as very funny, engaging, and a nice guy. Well, perhaps he was a nice guy if you were on his good side, but you certainly did not want to cross Jackie Cirone. Cirone would move on to be Salvatore Giancana's protege. During his time under Giancana, Cirone worked as an enforcer. At five foot six and 195 pounds, one might not think that Cirone was a very intimidating man, but as you'll see shortly, no pun intended, he got the job done. During his time working as an enforcer, Cirone would be arrested over 20 times for armed robbery, bookmaking, illegal gambling, and embezzlement. When Tony Accardo got into trouble with the IRS in the late 1950s, he passed control of the outfit's Las Vegas interest to John Cana then, a year later, put John Cana into the role of acting boss. In 1961, Cirone was part of the enforcer team responsible for the death of Lone Shark William Action Jackson. Before we move forward with this story, I need to do two things. Number one, I need to fill you in on Action Jackson's history. And number two, I have to warn you now, even for a mob murder, his murder is particularly gruesome. So be prepared and don't say that I didn't warn you. Jackson got the nickname Action as it was another word for juice or the interest owed to a loan shark. Also an enforcer who was very much the opposite of Cirone. Jackson was described by police as a man with the body of a giant and the brain of a child. He was known for his cruelty and was one of the outfit's juice men on several occasions to get men to pay up. He had been arrested for assault and robbery in 1941, and in 1947, he was arrested and charged with rape. However, he was able to avoid those charges. In 1949, he was sentenced to four to eight years for robbery. He was paroled in 1953 and worked as Chicago Outfit Muscle for a little under a decade until he was arrested for stealing a truck with $70,000 of electrical appliances. He had been offered the opportunity to become an informant in 1960, but declined. However, after the 1961 arrest, the story goes that the outfit believed he had flipped. In August of 1961, Jackson was kidnapped and led by gunpoint into a meat rendering plant. There, he would be tortured to death and left in the trunk of his own car. When police found Jackson's body, he had rope marks on his wrists and feet, cuts and burns covered his body, his chest had been crushed, and he had a hole in his right ear where some sort of sharp object had been shoved through. Jackson had been impaled through his rectum with a meat hook where he hung a foot above the ground. His kneecaps were broken. He was shot. His ribs were broken 
and a cattle prod had been used on his anus and genitalia, causing him to empty his bowels. He was tortured with a blowtorch until he was made to confess that he had turned informant. It is unknown whether or not he confessed to being an informant. He was left like this for three days until he died of his injuries. Another theory about the reason for the horrendous murder is that Jackson was killed not because he was suspected of being an FBI informant, but because he had raped another mobster's wife while that mobster was in jail. If you'll recall, Costa Nostra women, wives, mothers, sisters, daughters, etc., were to be respected, and the punishment for disrespecting them, certainly raping them, would be carried out with extreme prejudice. This claim has not been substantiated, but it would account for the particular heinousness of this crime and the specific targeting of Jackson's genitalia. This was usually used to send some sort of message. According to FBI records, in February of 1962, Torone was contracted by Jean Cana to kill Frank Esposito in Miami. Frank, the ex-Esposito, was a man who had helped to consolidate the Cook County Street Workers Unions along with Murray Humphreys. This murder plot was canceled, however, when the FBI agent, Bill Romer, who had obtained the information through electronic bugging, took this information to Tony Accardo and Paul Rica, who pressured John Cana to withdraw the contract. Esposito would die in 1969. The official story is that his death was due to heart problems, but the Esposito family maintains that the death was mysterious. Always just beside men like Accardo, Ayupa, and John Cana, Jackie Chironi was referred to as Jackie the Lackey. However, in the 1980s, Chironi went from lackey to boss. Through the 1970s, Chironi had done his job as Ayupa's underboss while he was the acting boss for the outfit under Accardo who had stepped into the consigliere role. Ayupa was in poor health and had started lessening his role in the outfit. The responsibilities that Ayupa was letting go, Chironi was picking up effectively making him Ayupa's acting boss and fully taking on the role in 1986, just in time to be convicted. All of this came crashing down when Ayupa and Chironi, along with several others, were convicted in 1986 for skimming $2 million from Las Vegas casinos. Chironi had worked hand in hand with Ayupa and his men in skimming money from the casinos owned by Argent Corp the front company that owns Stardust, the Hacienda, and the Fremont. One story that exemplifies Chironi's personality is that when a police witness during this trial was unable to identify him, he jumped to his feet, waved, and said, here I am, Howie. Each defendant was convicted of eight counts with a sentence that included a $10,000 fine. Chironi's legal team attempted to appeal, citing juror doubt that the skimming money went to Chironi and thusly, the outfit, but Chironi was sentenced to 28 and a half years behind bars. He would serve only about a decade. Chironi would serve his time and was released from prison on July 20th, 1996 due to poor health. Just six days later, on July 26th, 1996, Chironi would die of natural causes at the age of 82 in Barrington, Illinois, and was buried at Mount Carmel Catholic Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. His devoted wife, Clara Chironi, would outlive him by 12 years and would pass away at the age of 90 on September 28th, 2008. She was buried with her husband at Mount Carmel. Chironi's son Jack went on to become a very successful lawyer with Herbace and Chironi Law Firm in Des Plaines, Illinois, specializing in employees' rights, employment, and labor laws. According to Trib Live News, he graduated from Illinois Benedict University in Lyle, Illinois, then earned a law degree from DePaul University in Chicago in 1964. He joined the Chicago Bar Association in 1965 and even served as president of the Justinian Society of Lawyers of Illinois, a Chicago-based association of Italian-American attorneys. Chironi Jr. has admitted to associating with his father and has represented the Teamsters unions on a number of occasions. It has also been found that he was a minority stakeholder in the Pittsburgh Brewing Company whom he had represented. There is no evidence to suggest that Chironi Jr. is associated with Cosa Nostra or the Chicago outfit and he keeps a relatively low profile. Jack Chironi Jr. has said very little about his father publicly but told the Chicago Tribune following his father's death he was a gambler, a bookmaker all of his life, and he ran a tavern. He loved to be around people. He was my best friend. Whatever he did, he did, and kept that to himself. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews, talking about one of the Chicago Outfit's top men. Jackie Chironi completely exemplifies keeping your home and work life separate, and he has been an amazing study. It is hard to believe that he has such a personality when he had been such a brutal criminal. I am really enjoying these individual studies, and I hope you are too. Being able to dive deep into the specific pieces of the mosaic that makes up Cosa Nostra in the United States has been extremely fascinating and we're just beginning. If you have another person that you would like me to study, please make sure to comment. I will be happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao.